All right. Welcome, everybody. We're going to leave a few minutes here for people to come on in before we get into the meat of the uh, call here today. I am uh, I am excited about uh, what we've got on deck for you here today with the uh, Boston uh, Ujima project. Um, but let's uh, let's do some introductions here first so everyone knows who we are and what we're doing. So this is Community Capital Live, which is a partnership between several um, different groups, uh, several different really uh, groups that are making a big impact in the way economics are done and reporting on those things. So we have... Um, the Main Street Journal um, is a huge partner for us. Big shout out to them. Subscribe there. Um, they are kind of the place to go for information on local investing. Um, so if you want to invest your money locally, that's the first place you want to plug into. Uh, also, Neighborhood Economics. If you want to connect with other people who are making an impact on um, their own communities economically, Neighborhood Economics is the place you want to be. It's the place you want to be to connect to those people. Um, also want to shout out Impact Alpha, who is helping us store a database of these impact and local funds. Um, and they uh, are um, will be getting our podcast up with their podcast network here. We're in the works of that shortly. So check out Impact Alpha for all things impact investing. Um, and then my uh, show, The Mindful Marketplace, which is on Biz Radio US, um, which talks about social entrepreneurship, local and community investing, and democratically owned businesses. Um, so uh, yeah, really grateful. We'll want to um, going to introduce our panel here today, as well as our guest. And let you all know as you're coming in, um, we're going to be doing audience Q and A. So as you have uh, questions, feel free to type uh, type in the chat that either you've got a question or put that question up there in the chat, and we'll make sure to hit those at the end uh, before we leave here today. Um, so our panel, um, really really grateful for the panel that we've got with us today. Um, two real experts that kind of cover. Um, a lot of overlap, but some some sep some different things in what they're an expert in. Uh, Michael Schumann, who I mentioned from the Main Street Journal, who's also the author of several books on um, local investing, including his most recent, um, "Put Your Money Where Your Life Is." Great read. I, uh, I I read it a few years ago, and I should, probably should should go back to it and reread it now. Um, Michael Schumann is with us, as well as Kevin Jones, who is the co-founder of SoCap, which is in an impact investing conference, as well as Neighborhood Economics, which is the um, community and neighborhood economic um, conference, uh, impact investing conference that we mentioned earlier, um, as well as a few other organizations uh, along the way, too. Kevin is a kind of a master of the world of impact investing, and Michael being our um, our expert on local investing, we're happy to have both of them with us here. Um and we'll get to our guests now. So uh, Nia Evans comes to us from the Boston uh, Ujima Project. Nia, thank you so much for your time today and uh, welcome. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Joel. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit just kind of about your your background and where you came from and how, how your perspective was formed. All right. Oh, boy. Um... So professionally, well, I'll say educationally, I have a background in uh, industrial and labor relations and education. Uh, so I think that 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 um, that subject matter background definitely uh, plays a role uh, in my current work. So I would say from IOR, which is short for industrial and labor relations. Um, there's the there's the labor piece uh, that's huge. Um, so there is uh, both the personal and educational experience with collective bargaining, for example, uh, union organizing, um, and where that shows up in our work is with um, our community standards for investment, for example, uh, which emphasize workers' rights. Uh, it emphasizes, uh, or they emphasize the type of jobs uh, that um, we are interested uh, in supporting. And so investing in businesses that provide um, beyond good jobs, uh, great jobs, investing in businesses that explore employee governance, employee ownership, um, that looks at uh, compensation ratio. Uh, so that's that's huge. Um, and I, I, I actually can't, uh, trace it, but I did a, a, a interview with Michael, um, who asked a similar question, and and there I talked about um, being aware of Mondragon, for example, 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I honestly don't know how I found out about Marjorie. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it must have maybe been uh uh during some of my schooling, but becoming aware of at of co-op cooperatives, for example, um, at a certain point, and really being compelled by what that could mean um for people just having better work experiences and people having better uh, life experiences and so then that having um some direct positive impact on on the lives we're able uh to lead and so then thus uh the communities and societies and, and worlds that we live in um so that was huge uh professionally um I'd done advocacy work with boston brant and the naacp um, had also done some education and advocacy work in uh, New York. And I would say uh, the advocacy work that I'd done here in Boston definitely provided a direct link uh, to Ujima. Um, so it was when we were doing advocacy around um, decision-making and planning and development and uh, how communities of color are included or not included in those decisions, um, and on the search for a mechanism that allowed community members who felt uh, shut out of uh, decisions, period, and definitely felt shut out of um, big decisions uh, that would have huge impact, negative, positive, otherwise, uh, on our communities, and was interested in a mechanism that allowed for there to be more of a direct link uh, between uh, what communities knew, what we understood, uh, what we wanted, and what was actually happening in our communities. And so there's where I learned both about um, participatory budgeting as well as uh, the idea that Aaron Tanaka, who uh, is a co-founder, and I say the brainchild of Ujima, uh, was cooking up at the time. Um, and so that was, that was a direct link for me, was... Um, with the way Ujima adapts participatory budgeting to the investment process, doing a few things that community members said that we wanted, um, which was the means to actually see our agenda through, uh, actually being heard, actually being listened to, actually having voice, actually having say so. And, and what that means is uh, what we want actually happening. Um, and if it doesn't happen, uh, we're a part of the conversation about why it, it could not or, or or did not happen. Uh, so we we understand how our how our input played of the in the decision making because we're a part of the decision making. Uh, so that's that's what led me led to, that's what led me to Ujima. Um, I saw it as a direct mechanism uh, for community members to shape our communities and was also compelled by on top of that with the investment fund not only being able to vote on what it is we invest in, but if we wanted to, uh, we could also even invest, invest ourselves because it was pretty, is pretty accessible with the minimum investment being $25. Mm. Yeah, so I guess when it comes to this new fund, uh, I, that's kind of why we had you on here was to talk about the fund that you are, that you guys were, you're collecting funds to reinvest back into your community. Tell us a little about, I guess I, I'd like to know kind of what was the the impetus or what was the need that you guys really saw that was most immediate that you wanted to uh, fulfill and how have you gone about doing it? Yeah, there. Uh, so one, one of my colleagues is, just came into the room who I was not expecting to come in, James Van Boy. Hi, James. So James is our uh, chief of staff community and culture. Uh, so good to see you. And um, I don't know, maybe you can jump in every now and then. Um, so there there are a couple of origin stories um, that I tell about Ujima um, that I think solve, um, or not solve, but address a similar problem in different arenas. Uh, so the first origin story I tell um, is of the creation of Cedro Cooperative, who some people may be familiar with. Uh, they were our first uh, investment vote. Uh, so we've we've made a we made a one hundred thousand dollar investment or voted to invest one hundred thousand dollars of them um, at the end of December at the end of twenty nineteen in December. Uh, so um, I mentioned Eric Tanaka uh, already uh, prior to CED, uh, which was Eugene's fiscal sponsor until recently. Um, Aaron was the executive director at an organization called Boston Workers Alliance. And this was an organization that was working to reintegrate people um, coming coming back home uh, after incarceration. And one of the uh, focuses was um, employment. 
Um, so as you can imagine, uh, happens a little less so today, maybe, hopefully. Uh, but people who have uh, criminal records def experience quite a bit of stigma, quite a bit of di discrimination. Um, and so uh, this organization had arrived, um, had, had, had been part of a coalition that had a pretty progressive, pretty progressive legislative victory, which was ban the box legislation. So I think at that time, Massachusetts was the second state in the nation uh, to pass this legislation. Um, a lot of uh, very promising, a lot of hope. And it, it essentially said you, you could not look at a person's criminal record until a certain point of the employment process. Um, turns out, as with uh, as we learn with with uh, with a lot of things, there are some some loopholes, there are some gaps, uh, and it turned out that employers could actually still access criminal records via the RMV or some people would say DMV where they are. And um, so for this organization, which was a membership organization, they found themselves at a point where they said, we don't want to be at the mercy of employers and hoping that they are benevolent enough to not stigmatize us or discriminate against us. Mm -hmm. um, we want to kind of take our our own destinies, our own fates into our into our hands. And uh, one way we think we can do that is entrepreneurship, via entrepreneurship, via business ownership, because then we'd be creating our own employment opportunities. Uh, so the first thing that they tried, and I should mention uh, one of the members and mentors and advisors was uh, one of our late city councilors, Chuck Turner, uh, who's 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 very well uh, well regarded here, has been has been very impactful. Um, so one of the first things they tried was was, I think, like an alternative fuel uh, business, things like fuel, fuel made out of peanut oil or something like that. I remember I remember those conversations uh, in those days was not quite a hit in Roxbury, uh, but they were able to take uh, the learning experience and apply it to to another business uh, idea, which was they knew that there was legislation coming down that would require uh, companies, organizations, et cetera, with more than four tons of food waste to compost. And so they said, we think we see we see an we see an opportunity here. Um, companies are going to have to figure out how to comply we can be the ones that help them uh, comply. So this is this is the birth of what we now know as federal uh, cooperative. Um, as you can imagine, uh, people who are experiencing discrimination in employment are probably also going to experience that when it comes to financing. And that indeed was the case. So traditional banks uh, were not opening their doors uh, to this to this group. And by this point, Aaron Tanaka is now working at Boston Impact Initiative, who I know quite a few of us know uh, on the call. Uh, Boston Impact Initiative was started by Deborah Fries, and at this point uh, is influential in introducing uh, racial equity uh, to the uh, impact uh, conversation and in including racial equity as a definition of impact. Uh, whereas for there, there are people on this call uh, who have been in the impact world uh, much longer than me, uh, so can either confirm or deny that previously it was it was pretty kind of ESG. It was pretty looking at environment, looking at looking at governance, looking at looking at social. So our understanding is this was this was a new development uh, in that in that paradigm. Um, so Aaron's learning about different types of finance. Uh, beyond what's happening traditionally, and um, he's able to connect this group uh, with uh, sources. Uh, so they did a DPO, a direct public offering, and I believe through that DPO they raised between three hundred and three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I, I kind of have to check the number. I'll say between two hundred fifty and three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I have to check the numbers. They got a grant from the Bar Foundation. Um, they got a they got some financing from uh, Boston Impact Initiative, and then we have the sweat equity. Uh, they also organized themselves as a cooperative. Uh, so this was a uh, worker owned um, cooperative. Um, sorry, this was a worker owned cooperative uh, owned by Black and Latinx uh, people in Roxbury uh, and Dorchester, uh, immigrant owned, um, and so. 
through their ownership and through building up the business, um, they also have their sweat equity. And so here we see essentially different types of stakeholders uh, and different types of money coming together. So we see uh, impact investment, we see philanthropy, uh, we see regular communities or community capital, uh, and we we see uh, small business uh, ownership uh, coming together to create this venture. And so um, Aaron wondered, why couldn't this happen more essentially? So the the kind of uh, learning was here you had two sectors, you had organizing and you had finance, both creative sectors and their own right, who don't usually work together. And look what happened when these sectors came together. They were able to create this venture uh, that in a different paradigm uh, was not possible. So that's that's the that's the first origin story I tell. And and there we see the problem is what that we have a small business um, that cannot get traditional financing. And so this is this is what was being addressed. The second origin story I tell is is very similar. So it, it's also around funding. It's also around financing um, now in the grassroots sector. Uh, so um, Aaron had also at the same time started an organization called Center for Economic Democracy. Uh, Center for Economic Democracy, Boston Impact Initiative, and another organization named City Life Vita Urbana, uh, which is a housing justice organization in Boston, um, hosted a group of about 40 people uh, to study what it would take to start a public bank. And the thinking here was, um, at the time, uh, there was there were some uh, unenviable uh, lists that Boston was at the top of. Uh, so fastest gentrifying city, in its category at that time, um, I think number one in inequality at that time. Um, a report had come out about the racial wealth gap in, in Boston that was just um, stunning. Um, and then also seventh most, seventh most segregated city. Uh, and so this is this is the backdrop uh, of our work. Uh, so what we what we know companies gentrification is displacement. So dealing with uh, dealing with massive displacement. Um, and then we also have uh, on top of that poverty that is has become less of a topic in certain places with with the racial wealth gap conversation coming in. But we know this is a this is an old conversation uh, and unfortunately is, is an enduring reality in lots of communities. So it's against these this backdrop that you have organizations like City Life Vita Urbana, for example, um, uh, trying to uh, work with communities um, to to experience material uh, improvements. And one one part of the thinking was um, we can barely sustainably finance ourselves. Uh, so most of our orgs we get uh, philanthropic funding um, that is. Sub, that can be subject to whims, depending on who the funder is. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, money or resourcing can be can become abruptly uh, unavailable, spend a lot of energy, spend a lot of time trying to access that funding. And so this is why this group said, what if we had a public bank um, that could allow us to more sustainably finance ourselves so that we're not kind of on this hamster wheel and we can devote more of our energy uh, to to work that we're doing in our communities. And I'm almost done, Joel, because I know this was a little long. Mm -hmm. um, and what the group, so they studied this for a year. They also studied uh, co community loan funds, alternative currency, participatory budgeting. So the group ended up studying all of these different models and processes uh, that they felt appropriately centered both working class communities and communities of color. Mm -hmm. Um, and what they concluded was, well, one, a public bank is hard. Uh, so there's a there's a movement afoot right now that's gaining more and more momentum, which is great and is also a testament to how hard it is. Uh, there was only one at the time in North Dakota that this group was was studying this, and that had been started over a hundred years ago. The second thing was the group said, well, even if even if it were easier, this is actually just one thing. It's actually a singular address. When we think about inequality, when we think about poverty, when we think about displacement, um, we understand these as systemic issues, We understand, and we understand them as interconnected. So to have a singular address is not appropriate. Um, perhaps what's more appropriate is an address that's similarly systemic, 
and similarly interconnected. And so from that was was born the ecosystem approach that Ujima uses, which is right, I call it a mashup sometimes. So I'll say we, we kind of chose some of our favorite things and said, let's put them together because what we see is they're great on their own, but they're siloed. So they're either geographical silos when we look at these different parts or they're sectoral silos. And so what if we put them together in one place? So uh, getting rid of those geographical silos um, and what if we try them at, at once? And so getting rid of those sectoral silos and let's see what we get. Uh, so perhaps each part uh, works to support the next next part uh, and make it stronger. And then perhaps we have a whole that's more than the sum of its parts. Um, and so that became Ujima. So that's how Ujima mm. uh, came to be. Yeah. I, I want to kick it over to Michael first. Um, I know he's got, I'm sure he's got enough. Try to just pick a couple questions if you can. No, no. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll start there and then we'll go from Michael to Kevin. And then, like I said, we'll come back around with our audience. Great. So um, Nia, nice, nice to see you. And uh, see you. I should say that Nia has been very kind to speak to my business class every year that I've been teaching for about uh, seven years, eight years. So I've had this opportunity to sort of see the work really evolve. And I'll just say, uh, especially for purposes of those who've just come on the call, uh, what we're talking about is an existing fund with about $5 million in it and another fund in planning uh, that aims to be $25 million that goes for property, real estate, um, and related forms of support. What I wanted to highlight, though, and, and um, the origin stories were great, but what I think are three features of the Ujima Fund that are pretty unique, or at least they were pretty unique when you started, and now there's a few others that have taken this on as well and maybe just elaborate a little bit on them. So one, one is the participatory nature that community members are actually making the funding decisions. The second is the way that you have nested the fund in a series of programs that support local economic development, like nurturing anchor institutions. And finally, how you've put the greatest degree of risk on the deepest pocket investors. So if you could just address those and then I'll, then Joel, I'll, I'll, I'm done for a while. We'll hand it over to Kevin. Wow, you got all the good questions, Michael. I, mean, I had that same list almost, but okay. Fine. All right, cool. Thank you, Michael. So I'll start with the, the last one first because because that'll just allow me to talk about the fund design. So I appreciate that. Um, so, um, so as Michael said, uh, when we launched the fund in 2018, at the end of 2018, we made history as the nation's first democratically governed investment fund. And so that was the first question that Michael asked, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, in terms of the fund uh, design, um, a large part of the fund design is based on uh, Design of Boston Impact Initiatives Fund. And I would say that that is one of the our, our participatory process is one of the key differences, uh, for example, between our fund, and this is because Boston Impact Initiative now is on their next fund. And I should say I'm on the board of Boston uh, Impact Initiative. Um, so just full disclosure there. Uh, but this was the fund that they launched in, I think they launched it 2017. Um, so we uh, did a few things with this fund. Um, so one, we created a pool strictly for investors, unaccredited investors in Massachusetts. And this was a way to provide as much uh, opportunity as possible for uh, community members who don't who don't usually have an opportunity uh, to participate in this fashion, uh, to participate. Uh, so as I stated earlier, the minimum investment for that pool was $25. Um, and again, we restricted it to um, unaccredited investors in the state of Massachusetts. Um, the return for that pool, um, I, sh I should say the um, target return for that pool was 3%. Uh, then the next pool, uh, and that pool is called Kuji Chakalia, which is uh, Swahili for self-determination. And I should also say Ujima is Swahili for collective work and responsibility. Um, 
The second pool that we created is called Umoja, uh, which is Swahili for uh, unity. And that has that's broken up into two parts, one for unaccredited investors in uh, Massachusetts, New York, Colorado, Rhode Island, and Maine. Um, and this is based on where it was pretty simple uh, for us to get the exemptions that we needed to sell securities there. So what I should also mention is um, as a fiscal sponsee of Center for Economic uh, Democracy, which is a 501c3, uh, we got charitable exemptions uh, from the SEC, and we are now our own independent uh, 501c3. So I just like to make sure I throw in some of those technical details for people uh, as well. And so I'm from California. Uh, I would have loved to have been able to offer this to my friends and loved ones at home. And our attorneys told us California way too hard to try to get that uh, exemption. Uh, we don't recommend it. So that's why some of the some of the states could seem random and what's missing could also seem random. But that's that's what's behind that decision making. And then another part of that you uh, pool is for accredited investors um, and accredited means uh, you either have a net worth of a million dollars, not including your uh, resident, your personal residence, or um, you can command a, ca a salary of of more than two hundred thousand uh, dollars for a couple of years. So, so in other words, you 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 have a good amount of wealth uh, is what accredited means. Um, and the target returns for that pool uh, for a three year note, I believe. Uh, we said it's two uh, percent, and then I think for a seven-year note, I have to double check. I think we said we said three percent. But the thing to notice is that that pool, uh, the target return is less than Kudi Uh We have another pool, uh, which is the Nia note, and Nia is Swahili for purpose, and uh, that is aimed at uh, accredited investors uh, and institutions so here now we are thinking of our our foundations and our largest and our larger investors minimum investment is five thousand dollars forgot to say the minimum investment for umoja is one thousand dollars and the target returns for the nia pool is one and a half percent so this is um this is unusual uh so what's what's more traditional is the more an investor puts in the higher a return uh, that they can expect. Um, I had a couple of friends initially who thought we made a mistake and I had to tell them, no, this is actually intentional. So for us, this is um, uh, one way of being distributive. It's small, uh, but we think it's important. Um, and it's also our way of being grounded in reparations. So we don't say it, it is reparations, but we do say it's grounded in, in reparations. And so the idea being, uh, communities and community members who we know have been historically um, and contemporarily uh, disinvested in, um, who have not been able to see the rewards of their contributions uh, to to their communities and, and to our society. Um, they're getting some of that. They're getting some of that back. Um, it's another way that we've worked to redefine risk because we also say, well, the person who's uh, has less disposable income who's making that $25 or $50 investment, we actually think, you know, you could argue they're taking uh, a, a larger risk uh, than the person who has more disposable income and can make a $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 uh, investment. So that's also our way of, of, of doing some redefinition of, of risk, um, expanding what that looks like, and then also um, changing the, as I said earlier, changing the relationship between traditional risk and reward. Um, so uh, so that was that was very uh, intentional there. And then Michael referred to kind of how we um, then, even beyond that, move to try to uh, protect, for lack of a better word, the investment of the Kujichakalia pool um, as best as we can, which is um, we created uh, we created basically a process whereby should we make, should we just have really bad luck? Uh, should we make really bad decisions uh, and the fund takes a hit? The NEA note investors know that they're going to get hit first. 
and then it's going to go uh, in reverse order. So uh, the NIA note is, is going to be impacted first, then or NIA investors, then Umoja investors. And, and again, hopefully, um, Kuji Chakalia investors have been shielded enough that they don't experience that negative impact. Um, and if they do, it's to it's to a much lesser extent than the emergent investors and the and the knee investors. So that's the that's the third question that um uh th that Michael had. And again, the same same uh thought process going into how we want to reconsider risk, um, how we um want to acknowledge that both on the reward side and on the uh, not being too negatively impacted. Although we are we are careful to not guarantee uh, returns because we also think that that's important. Um, so this is still an investment. Loss is still possible. So we are careful in our communication uh, not to communicate as if everything is, is guaranteed and nothing's going to go wrong. Um, so first question then was um, talk about the participatory aspect. Uh, which is, I mean, it's my favorite part. Uh, people, you know, I, I, I appreciate it, and I'm, and I can com comply as you can see. People love to kind of geek out about some of the technical aspects of the fund, and I think that's interesting. But definitely, my favorite part is the participation. Um, so not only are we tr trying to provide opportunities for people to participate via investment, um, even more than that, uh, our members uh, vote directly on what it is that we invest in. And we have two broad tiers of membership. Uh, one is our voting membership. And to be a voting member, you simply have to be a resident of Boston proper, period. That's it. So essentially what we're saying is it is your res it is it is by virtue of your residence uh in the in communities um that you are entitled uh to make decisions about what happens uh in your communities. So this is even unattached to in <clears throat> They can invest. They don't have to. Um, so here we're decoupling um, investment and decision making power. Um, so we are we are um, yeah kind of interrupting the notion of accumulating shares or having accumulated wealth, uh, for example, and so then be so then being entitled to more say so or more decision making power. Um, what we do is we, in the past, and we still do this, but we've added some things. Uh, we would have neighborhood assemblies and citywide assemblies. These are these are gatherings uh, where half are UGMA members and half are community members. And this is important because we also want to transmit the notion that it isn't it isn't a particular. You don't have to be affiliated with a specific organization to have this decision making power. We think you should have this decision-making power, again, because you are a community member. Ujima as an organization, um, we really exist uh, as, a, as a way to try what we're doing um, to hopefully inspire others. And we, we've seen that we have, we have done that. Um, and for um, what we're doing to actually just become normal in communities uh, so that all actors uh, in our communities uh, come to understand that decision making and re really have uh, community members having real decision making power um, can have real uh, material impact, um, and it can lead to better outcomes uh, than what we experience in most communities, in which again, as I said, we're either shut out, or if we are part of some process, it's it's kind of bogus, it's kind of disingenuous. Mm -hmm. um, and we find it's kind of uh, disconnected. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, we say you can name businesses even if you are not a member of Ujima. Um, so what we do is we take all those names. There's no uh, behind the scenes uh, work that we do. We take them all, we put them into a list. Uh, what we had done in the past was then we had our members uh, kind of vote to ratify that as a formal investment plan. Um, we have learned, so we we definitely have learned and refined some processes over the years that that was too much information for members. So our first list that we had that members were reviewing, I think it had 140 businesses on it. Um, so we definitely had to say, well, there's there's no way members truly considered 140 businesses <laughs> and were well enough and were well informed enough to vote on this. 
we tried it again with our second list, which had 80 members or 80 businesses. And and we then switched to more of a delegate uh, process, which I can talk about a little later, but just for the sake of time, I won't talk about now. Um, and so we have now investment plans that are organized by neighborhood. And Boston is a city of neighborhoods. Uh, so we have investment plans that are organized oh. by neighborhoods. And then what we do is once we have those investment plans, and this is probably the hardest part of our job, quite honestly, and it, it has thankfully gotten easier easier over the years, is we then work to connect with those businesses. Uh, there are some that we know that we already have relationships with, and there, there are many that we don't know that we don't have relationships with. So then we do a lot of work trying to connect with those businesses, convince them we're not a scam. Um, so, you know, if you get something in the mail that says you could, you can get some money that's dubious. So we, you know, try to convince them we're legitimate. Um, and then we take it from there. Uh, we let them know they can join a business alliance and that opens them up to investment as well as other support. And this goes into your second question, Michael. Um, and then we take it from there. So, so I talked about other supports so and I'll go into the second question. And appreciate you uh, drawing this out, Michael. So this is the ecosystem approach that I talked about. Um, so smack dab, we have an ecosystem map um, that perhaps uh, can be shared around with the recording. Um, I can I can send it. Uh, but smack dab in the middle of the ecosystem map is our membership that I just talked about, our people. Um, and then we also have our fund. Um, but we know that... Uh, Monetary investment is not the only support that a business is need that a business needs. Uh, so, we other parts of the ecosystem are our business alliance, which I mentioned, and as a part of the business alliance, um, our businesses can get investment. Uh, they can get whatever type of technical assistance they need. Uh, so, with that, we've created a technical assistance network. Uh, we have a lot of technical assistance providers in the city of Boston, so we don't actually try to provide that assistance ourselves. What we do is we try to just do some vetting, some footwork for businesses because they've told us um, that's kind of the hard part is determining who's who and, and trying to pick who's right for them. Um, so we do some of that work for them and we form partnerships. So one of our uh, big TA partners, for example, some people may be familiar with is Boston Center for Community Ownership. And so what we do is when a business joins, one of the first things they do is uh, they'll have an intake appointment with Boston Center for Community Ownership, and they'll tell us everything that they need. So businesses, things that come up pretty regularly, uh, help with bookkeeping, uh, help with accounting, uh, help with marketing, always number one. And so that is the one piece that we do try to provide ourselves um, because we put a lot of resources into communications. We think we do marketing pretty well. And so that we do feel confident that we can partner uh, uh, with a with a business on. Um, we have an anchor institution strategy uh, that Michael talked about. And again, this came from our businesses. So what we didn't do was, um, yeah, just kind of create a standardized list of services um, that would be convenient for us to provide. But when we uh, created the alliance. We did it much like we created Ujima, which was we co-created it with a, a founding set of members. And we asked them, what do you need? And so, as I said, what they told us was marketing. What they told us was they, they'd like to be able to go after larger contracts. Uh, they told us uh, they were interested in alternative uh, currency. Uh, there were, there are two other things that I'm, that I'm forgetting. Um, but with Anchor Institution Strategy, what we do there is uh, we try to work with universities and uh, hospitals. Uh, th th those are some big anchors here in Boston. And really, our focus there is working on relationships. So I think a lot of what, what comes up a lot of times with Anchor Institution Strategies is the kind of um, procurement process and kind of the certification process and the technical process. And our businesses have told us we know that. Hmm. Um what we don't have though are relationships. So when the supplier diversity manager uh, at Boston Children's Hospital is trying to figure out uh, who they who they're going to call, um, they're going to call who they have a relationship with, who they're familiar with. And so what we work on is helping businesses uh, build and deepen those relationships uh, themselves. Um, I'll pause there just for the just for the sake of time. Oh. <laughs> 
Wow. I I, I guess I'll I'll be the one to jump in. That was so amazingly well-connected description of an ecosystem uh, approach. You know, as I look at you and I look at the Good Business Alliance and I look at all the other things, you have a time bank. You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like you're a investment-focused, sustainable uh, uh, chamber of commerce in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, and, and then you also have one of the things I found really interesting is uh, that you do donor education for your folks to understand what the heck these donors are really saying, you know, and there's so much, uh, I think that's what I, what I saw the education was to, to understand the world of the donor. Mm. Uh, that may not I- be the way I read it right. No, say more about that, Kevin. And what are you what are you looking at specifically? Uh, I, I can go back to the part of your site, I guess. Uh, but but I thought it was helping your folks understand how to talk to a donor and and how to do that capital outreach. Oh, okay. I think I know what you're talking about. I have I have two questions or not yeah. two questions, two answers to that. So I think you may may have wandered on a part um early in our uh early in our tenure um when we okay. had a lot of investor outreach mm-hmm. and um we had uh a, we had an investor outreach member team uh we also had a um an outreach member team that was more focused on kind of members and community members and then at one point we even had a fundraising team Okay. Um, and I'm not sure the material you're looking at, but this is what this okay. is. Okay. It could be an old report, uh, one of your yeah. old reports. That's probably what it was. Okay. Also, feel free to feel free to drop it in the chat. Yeah, too. I'll 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 I'll, I'll do it when I'm when I'm uh, not on camera. Okay. Uh, so, but no, I'll I'll answer that question though because I think there are two yeah. two answers to this. I I do appreciate the question. So the first answer is yes. So we did that. We did we we did do that. So we did have a period of time. Um, where we worked with people on investor outreach. And the reason I, I appreciate the question um, is because reaching out to potential investors is different mm-hmm. um, from uh, doing outreach with more, I'm just going to say traditional, for lack of a better word, donors, mm. at least for a nonprofit. Um, it is It is a different process. It is a different conversation. Mm. Um, and even, even the person, cause we have some people who have both donated to the organization and invested in the fund, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even the same person, um, is going to be interested in different, um, right. different things with, with, with regards to both possibilities. So on that note, um, so definitely one thing we learned, um, uh, which we kind of knew, but I think it was also surprising, how deeply it was proven was investment is sexier to a lot of people than donation. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So that was one thing because we had the fund. And so there was a way in which um, w- by the time we launched, we had enough pent up demand uh, that we had a pretty, a pretty nice launch. I think we launched in December, 2018, I want to say mid December, and I would say by the end of the year, we had already had five hundred thousand dollars in investment, right. and that was based on us talking about this fund in prior years, in twenty seventeen and twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we had to say there's an organization that's hosting this fund, um, and that requires resourcing. And we definitely had actors who would invest in the fund but would not donate right. to the org, and so that there was that education. For sure, to say this fund doesn't run itself, mm-hmm. um, and we weren't and not only this fund doesn't run itself, but we also weren't doing fund manager fees, so we were mm. we also were not <clears throat> on that. So, right. And because we are a community capital fund, and because we are a member based organization, um, what was really important um, was uh, setting up communications and programming um, that kept us in. Uh, that kept us in connection with community members. And so this mm-hmm. is where we needed this organization who was going to run this fund because um, as Michael talked about, um, and as I talked about, it isn't just a fund, it's a right. fund within an ecosystem. So that was, so that was one it's thing. It's a fund within an ecosystem, right? Right. Yeah. Um, the second thing, cause here's the second answer. 
Then even on the donation side, I think what we've done well, and James, my colleague, who's our chief of community, chief of community culture, I forgot your title, James, but <laughs> um, works with <laughs> works with me on fundraising. I think one of the things we 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 do a couple of things. So one, we don't do this ourselves. You definitely do this, Kevin. You definitely do this, Michael. Um, our fiscal sponsor, this is one of the, our, our, our prior fiscal sponsor, this is one of the things they've done. Um, we know that we have peers that do funder organizing. So we don't do it ourselves, but we know that that work is happening. And a part of that work um, is this education that you're talking about. But I think it's, it's, it's direct education to potential investors and to potential donors um, about for example, impact investing, right? Um, about what it looks like to be in partnership uh, with orgs like ours, with working class communities, with communities of color, meaning your wealth is not um, driving the conversation. Your wealth is not dominating the conversation. Um, we, we are after true deep uh, partnerships. So we know that that work happens. And so then what we're able to do ourselves when we're having our own conversations, particularly with institutional funders, but even with some individual potential individual investors, is to kind of piggyback off of those conversations. Right. So that in the other direction, investors, donors, funders know how to interact with us in a way that is co-equal and that does not presume right. a hierarchy. Does that make sense? Right. Sure. You're changing the power relationships and right. you're not used happen? to it. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and so, in what it, it's such a complex ecosystem, and I could go on for a while. We're near close to our time, and this is super fascinating. <clears throat> what would be the easiest way to replicate Ujima in a place mm -hmm. that was fertile and kind of ready for it? Yeah. So I I so I appreciate that question. So I I would say the easiest way. I'm gonna say is the easiest way, and I think people should also be ready. Uh, for it to take some time, yeah. For it not to be quick, mm. but it's still the easiest way, I think, because I I can I can talk about too what I think is probably not a great way. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest way. So as you you said, if we're, if you're in a environment that's fertile, and I'd be I I would love to hear how you would describe fertile. But for me, when I think fertile, I think of um in a place who the stakeholders are. Um, hopefully the stakeholders are diverse and by diverse, I mean their role. So as I described Cedro, for example, um, who, who came together to make that happen and what are their relationships with each other? Right. So that's, that's means, how I would do it. Yep. Right. So fertile means like they're actually already in relationship with each other. They're not right. starting from scratch when it comes to right. that. <clears throat> and I think <clears throat> And I think the easiest way. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, yeah, it, it, there was a, a a city that wanted to bring a neighborhood economics to town, and they were really happy. That's our conference, mm -hmm. and we repair and bring together people repairing local economies. And they had this, you know, one small city. You know, like th that was their thing. And we had a great day with the first of them, and then we met the next day with people of color and LGBT and and several marginalized groups, and they said. They hadn't bring, talk to us about the design, but we know we're on the outreach list in the next two weeks for them to tell us their plan. Right. And so we said, oh, well, you, that's not a fertile place. Right. If exactly. the community isn't in on the design, then, you know, just keep doing the same thing. So that, exactly. that, that's what it, I think of as fertile. No, exactly. And that's 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 what I was going to say is not a great way. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, so if it's fertile, and this is why um, I do even though it takes some time, tell the origin stories. Um, because I think a great way um, is to get people together to study something. And so what I would say the easiest way is the study group that this group did on public banking and they landed mm. in that ecosystem. I think the easiest way is get everyone together and so decide what is it that we want to uh, well, so it, let me follow up on that. So mm -hmm. it, it might be to study something that's plausible, but might be wrong that leads you to the other things. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I want to follow up with you and have yeah. another conversation. Yeah. And then the second thing, and yeah. I, I just want to emphasize what you said. Sorry, Joel, just really quickly what Kevin said. I would say no, the great way uh, or, or a not great way to do it 
is exactly what Kevin described. So we had a similar experience. We were brought to a city. Um, and I think what that group did was they looked at our ecosystem. They said, okay, they have these pieces. They have these types of people. Let's bring them in the room together. And the same thing happened. Um, we did a whole exercise. It was great. I had fun. Um, I think the participants also were inspired to have fun. And then every single Black person in that room, without exception, came up to me afterwards and said, so we've never had a conversation with these people a day in our lives. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Kevin. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. That, that's just, that was that, you know, and, and and when we told them we were turning a message, like, what did you not like about our plan? And it's like, well, you know, who designed it? <laughs> you know, it was... Anyway, yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. But, you know, studying something is the way forward. We're uh, just really quickly, we're looking to possibly try to do a sustainable business or a, a, a chamber of commerce here. And the sustainable folks, I was asked a keynote here in Asheville for the North Carolina Sustainable Business. And it was great, you know, uh, breweries with good practices and stuff like that. <clears throat> there was absolutely nothing on economic justice. So I'm looking for a sustainable chamber of commerce for all. I don't want to see what can bring that together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be that it's studying something and taking the Ujima approach with investment at the center rather than purchasing. Right. Anyway, I, I will be, I will follow up. That, that was Michael's idea. Uh, I'll send you an email. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Joel, back to you. I, 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 I can, yeah, I have no. another hour to go, but probably, Oh yeah. Well, I'm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just, well, I, Thank you. I wouldn't expect anything else. Um, yeah. I did want to hit uh, one of our audience members who's been here with us, I mean, a lot here, maybe our, our most uh, active one recently from Equal Exchange, Nicole. Uh, Nicole, would you want to unmute? Because I'd love to actually just hear your questions straight straight from you if we can. Uh, yes, this is fascinating. And this whole series has been great. So yeah, I feel lucky to have lucked upon this. Nice to meet you, Nia. Um, I guess I was wondering, just in terms of some nuts and bolts, like, what is the appetite for risk in mm -hmm. this fund for these community businesses? Like, obviously, you're dealing with, you know, non-traditional businesses that can't get traditional lending. Sometimes that's because they're either high risk or low capital. So how has the fund been doing so far? I mean, I'm familiar with Saro. Mm -hmm. One of my coworkers is there now. And like that oh. one, I'm a bit more familiar with. But um, yeah, what sort of how are the businesses doing what kind of risk are you comfortable with and uh, how many community members in the first fund for residents have you gotten? Just just yeah. kind of to give us some context of some numbers. I know that's a bunch of questions, but. No, for sure. And you put it in the yeah. chat. So that's super helpful. So I'm looking at it too. Thank you. Nicole. Great. Um, so yeah, so I, that's a really good question. So what is the appetite for risk in the fund's community investments, business investments? So this may sound contradictory, but I'm going to say it is both high and low at the same time. And the reason I say that is because, as you you pointed out, um, so far, so quick answer to some other questions. So far, we've invested in nine businesses. So, so, so far, the four and a half million, we've deployed 1.9 million. Um, let me think about this. I think out of those, there are probably two businesses that, um, well, out of the, out of those, I think there's one, I think there is one business, um, that probably had the best opportunity for traditional finance um, and I actually have to check with them because I don't think they, they got any. And so I actually have to check with them to see if they knocked on, if they knocked on anybody's doors. I think they did and didn't get it. So, so then already we're looking at businesses, as you said, um, and, and as we acknowledge, um, cannot get traditional financing. I think the number one reason is racism. Um, that also does not rule out, though, uh, that some of the businesses are truly indeed risky. Um, so one is a startup restaurant. That's risky. Um, we have uh, peers that wouldn't even do that. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think what else. Uh, th that one definitely one uh, startup uh, digital media company. 
that's risky. Um, the only other finance they've gotten are angel investors, and uh, they they uh, were part of uh, Ma a VC program here in Massachusetts and, and got a little bit there. And so now I say hi, because these are businesses that have been named <laughs> by community members. So community members have said, invest in this business. Um, but then I also say, whoa, because uh, we do a lot of education. So <laughs> we, um, for all of our investments, we provide two sets of memos. So we'll provide an initial credit memo or equity memo, and that'll give the financials, that'll, that'll give a, a digestible business plan. Um, it'll give the terms of the investment we're thinking about. And we see from community members' reactions, um, they're conservative. So they definitely have a sense of either I have invested in this fund myself or as a voting member, I consider myself a steward of this fund. I don't want to make a bad decision. Um, I don't want to be reckless with this money. So then there tends to, so then I think there tends to be some, tends to be a little conservative in the evaluation of the business. And so then um, there are some memos that we've sent, for example, the one so one that I was talking about, I think had a chance at traditional finance, and I, I have to check with them, is a is a newspaper. It's Boston's only Black-owned newspaper. We made an equity investment in them, a $265,000 equity investment. Now, the newspaper industry is terrible, right? So that's risky. And so what we did at, uh, at our last page in our memo, we said, this is being rated, I, I think we might have rated it as a, I can't remember if we rated it as medium or high risk. I have to double check. And we said, but here's why we are still willing to make this in investment. Um, we appreciate that we have two new owners um, who are kind of facing the headwinds, um, who have a certain kind of energy, who value local news and who are who are looking at not only maintaining the only black newspaper in Boston, but expanding it to other regions as well. So we we like that. We like that we have two uh, entrepreneurs here who are unafraid and who are not just going to kind of follow a trend, but do their part to hopefully shape trends. Um, and so there's an opportunity for that type of uh, education. So that's why I say hi and low at the same time. No, I hope there is a little bit more on the high, like not high, crazy high risk, but these can't be vetted the same way. You know, exactly. I feel like these spaces just wind up, if it is going to wind up being a conservative space, like well, what then is it, the Then it's the same and then there's no point. Mix exactly. in there. You're right. Exactly. Like, so, yeah. So like, we have, we, we have a chance to have some fun. Down. Yeah. We have a chance to have some fun conversations. So that's why I love that question, uh, Nicole. Because uh, we've done that a, a couple of times. So I talked about number of businesses. I talked about where we are in uh, deployment. And then the, the, your last question, right now we have around 950 members. Half of those uh -huh. are solidarity members and half are voting members. So we have around 400, 450 voting members. Um, our When we first started our quorum for a decision to be binding was 50% plus one. So we wanted to say at least a majority of members are approving this investment. This year, we raised it to 60% because our participation just went up every with every investment vote. So that also lets us know, if I back up a little bit, that proves community members want to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. Because we could have done this and we could have learned that community members said, no, nah, we're fine. <laughs> we appreciate the effort, but we're good. Let other people do that. But the fact that we've never had a failed investment vote and that the rate of participation has gone up each time lets us know investment decisions, they want to make those decisions. Um, they can handle the content. We do our part to educate uh, accessibly. Um, so we formally raised our quorum to 60% this year, and we're hoping that we'll get to 75% so that we can say a super majority of our members are approving these investments. Yeah, love it. Well, and honestly, obviously there's a lot to talk about because you're talking about what you said earlier, which is redefining what risk and reward really mean. Mm -hmm. And so um, love seeing the work that you guys are doing. I hope that this um, brings more eyes and more attention to the work that y'all are doing at the Bo uh, Boston Ujima project. Um, I'm excited to see how things develop for you and to keep an eye on on all of that work here. 
Um, and for those of you out there listening, remember we do this uh, every two weeks. We uh, stream live here and then we publish it up. Uh, if you want to subscribe and watch all the back conversations where we actually had Boston Impact Initiative as well as lots of other really great groups, uh, go to Mindful Marketplace Show on YouTube to uh, subscribe and to uh, watch the previous recordings. And as always, make sure to visit our partner groups, the Mindful Marketplace Show, um, the the Main Street Journal, Neighborhood Economics, and uh, Impact Alpha. And we're at a full hour. So until next time, everyone take care of yourselves out there. Take care of someone else. And remember, we are each other. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you sir.